welcome to Learn Your Color Computer. So let's begin. I'd like to say a few words about the biggest problem in the computer community today, and that's the closet computers. They're the ones that end up in your closet, alone and neglected, after a few fun hours with playing some games. This usually takes place a few months after Christmas, when somebody buys a color computer for the kids to play with. Then, when the fun wears off, into the closet it goes, to sit and gather dust, never to realize its full potential. Some folks may have just had it break down on them and decided not to get it fixed, even for a blown fuse. Well, this has gone on for too long now. With the millions of computers in people's homes today, only a few thousand of them have taken the time to learn their computer and take advantage of the remarkable power available in the small white case. Some people have even used their computers to run their own businesses. But this is not enough. If everybody who owned a closet computer was to become a serious color computer user, we'd be a more powerful group than any other. And this is what the series of shows is all about. So let's begin. Hi, welcome to the 11th installment of Learn Your Color Computer. In this installment, we're going to show you how to read and write sequential files to tape and disk using the commands of open, close, print number, input number, line input number, and EOF or end of file. Before we get into how to read and write files, you'll need to know a little bit about buffer numbers. Buffer numbers will range from negative 2 to 15 and are assigned like this. Minus 2 is the printer. Minus 1 is the cassette. 0 is the screen and keyboard and 1 through 15 are disk buffers. The first thing you'll need to know about writing a file is that you only need to open the file, send data into the device buffer, and close the file. To get a better understanding of the procedure, you need to see a program that does this simple task. For the sake of speed, we'll use the disk drive and we'll use buffer number one. Type this one in. First, we'll clear out memory with new, and then we'll start with line number 10, where we'll open, quote, O, quote, meaning for output, or writing, quote, um, in comma, number one, for our buffer number, comma, quote, file name, slash, dat, quote, for our file name and extension. Next, we'll go to line number 20, where we print number one, comma, quote, this is a string of text, quote. So we'll be printing to buffer number one instead of to the screen. Next, in line number 30, we'll do another print number one. But this time, we'll send some numeric data. One, two, three, four, five. Enter. Now, line 40, we'll close the file with the buffer number one. To close up our file, and now with line 50, we'll terminate our program with an end. The open command, as we've used it in line number 10, is followed 
by a function letter in quotes, which is either a capital letter O for output or a capital I, meaning input. This is followed by a comma and then the buffer number preceded by a number symbol. Another comma follows that. And finally, you have the file name inside of a set of quotes along with the extension. When using disk buffers, you may include inside the set of quotes a three-letter extension of your choice. If you don't specify one on a disk file, an extension of DAT, which we used here, is assumed by the computer and is automatically added. Next, in lines 20 and 30, we've used print number command using the number of the disk buffer we've opened to write a string constant and a numeric constant to the disk buffer. This is the same as the print number dash two command we used in the previous show to send text to the line printer. Then in line 40, we used the close command along with the buffer number, which was again preceded by a number symbol. As you probably guessed, it closes the file that's using the buffer we've opened earlier. You can have many files open at one time, so be sure to specify which buffer when closing. A close command by itself would close all the open buffers. Now run the program, and you should see a little bit of disk access, then all becomes quiet again. The file was written. It's now easy to see that all you need to do to write a file is to open it, print to its buffer, and close it again. Now comes the hard part, reading the file back into the computer's memory. Type in this little program. First, we'll clear out memory again with new. Then, we'll start with line number 10, where we open, quote, I, quote, comma, number one, comma, quote, file name, slash, dat, quote. Notice this time we used a capital letter I for the function code, meaning it input from the buffer. Next, we go to line 20, where we test to see if end of file, open parentheses, one, close parentheses, then go to 60. Notice this time we used the end of file command. It's used with the buffer in parentheses to test for an end of file condition, thus preventing us from trying to input any more data if we're at the file's end. Now we'll go to line 30 where, where we'll input number 1, comma, a string, colon, input, number one, comma, b. This is where we get our string and numeric constants back that we wrote before. Now in line 40, we print a string, colon, print, B. That'll print them to the screen so that we can see that we've actually got our data back. Now in line 50, we go to 20. Here the program returns to line 20 to test for an end of file condition. Now, we'll start with Start again with line 60, which was referenced by line number 20. 
where we close number one. This is where the program goes, like I said, as stated in line 20, when an end of file condition has, a, has been encountered. Now in line 70, we'll once again terminate our program with an end. Now run the program. And the disk drive comes on for a moment and then stops. As you can see, the string and number have been recalled from the file. This is a really nifty function. Using these files and their buffers, we can store any information that we need in a file. And as long as we test for an end of file condition before going to read the data, we can easily know when we're at the end of the information and close the file in question. But what if we didn't check to see if we were at the file's end? Let's find out. Change line number 20 like this. We'll go for line 20, where we'll tell it rem. Ignore me. I'm a remark. Now run the program again. In a matter of moments, you should get a result similar to the one I have here, which is IE error in 30. The error you see is the infamous input past end of file error, which the end of file command was preventing from happening all along. Now before we get any farther along, let's take a look at the alternate form of input from a device or file. It's the line input number command. It can be used in place of any input number command that reads a string. Plus there's an advantage. When inputting, it will accept a comma as part of the data where the regular input number command saw the comma as a tip-off that there's a different piece of data to read into the buffer. To prove that it can indeed replace the input number command on strings, let's retype a couple of lines in our little file reading program like this. Okay, we'll do line 20 over again, where we'll say if end of file, open parentheses, one, close parentheses, then go to 60. That will replace the line we bypassed before. Now we'll do line 30 where we line input number one, comma, a string, colon, input number one, comma, b. There we have our new replacement commands. Now run the program, and the disk drive will activate as before, and the same data will be retrieved and printed on your screen. As I said, the line input number command can replace any input number command that reads a string from a file. And most importantly, the most interchangeable item in reading and writing files is the buffer numbers. Using the same commands, you can simply change buffer numbers to use different devices. There are some exceptions to this, though. When using the printer or screen as a device, you don't need to open them first. They are opened automatically when the computer is first turned on. And remember to never try to input data from the line printer. It's not capable of sending data back to the computer. 
any attempt at reading data from the line printer is met with a bad file mode or FM error. There are a few things you have to watch for when reading and writing any files to tape and disk. First of all, be sure of your data. If you wrote a string, there must be a string variable reading it back in. And as such, if you write numeric data to the file, a numeric variable must read it back. Also, when you read and write to tape, you must keep a close eye on where your data is being placed. When writing, make sure the tape is advanced to a place on the tape where there is currently no data. This makes it a good idea to reset the tape counter on your recorder when you rewind to the beginning. So you can write down in a little notebook or on the tape label where each file begins and ends. The disk system will take care of that automatically. On disk files, also when reading from tape, make sure you remember to rewind the tape to where the file is or you'll pass it up altogether and have to reset the computer to recover from the situation. Here's a tip that will help you get the best results from tape file usage. When you're reading or writing a file, always have the tape recorder set to one unit above half volume mark. Say if your tape recorder's volume control is marked in increments from one to 10, like most recorders, set it to six. After about a year or two or of reading from, from tape files and writing tape files, the audio signal quality will become poor and you'll get errors while reading a file from, or a program from tape. You have a few options at this point, and this is what they are. First, have the recorder serviced. Or second, increase the volume level, which is a temporary measure. Or number three, buy a disk drive if you don't already have one. Any one of these options will work fine, but I strongly suggest buying a disk drive if you don't already have one. The disk drives are a little more reliable, and if you like, there are programs available that will allow you to back up an entire disk onto a 60-minute cassette as several files, and then put them back on the disk if you need to. So even if you do get a disk drive, hold on to the tape recorder and make sure it stays in working order. And lastly, but most importantly, don't try to read a file that was opened for output and don't try to write to a file that was opened for input. An attempt at either one would cause the same error as if you tried getting input from the printer, a bad file mode or FM error. I think you've been working with the basic programming language enough that I think you're ready for another one of those extra commands that I give you once in a while. This time, I'll show you how to use the kill command, which is used with a disk system to delete old files that you figure you either don't need anymore or you have a copy of it on another disk and just want to make room. To use the kill command, you must have the file's name with the file's extension following the command's name inside of a set of quotes. Here's how this works. First, we'll call up a directory of this disk to verify that the file we're going to delete is actually there. Type dir and press enter. It scrolled by a little fast, so let's get ready with a shift at and try again. Shift at, space, shift at, 
and there it is. We see the na file of file name dat appearing in the directory from the disk activity we caused earlier. So now that we know that the file is actually there, we can delete it with kill quote file name slash dat quote. There'll be a small amount of disk access while the file is being removed. This is because the disk controller is looking for the file in the directory to make sure the file we specify is actually in existence on the disk. And you can tell by the familiar OK on message on the screen that the file was found and was deleted. To make sure it really was deleted, let's take another look at the disk directory. Get ready to use your shift at command because it's a long directory we have here. Yep, file name dat was deleted. As we can tell by the absence of the file from the directory, the file was indeed deleted from this disk. Now what do you think would happen if we attempt to kill off a file that has already been killed? Well, let's take a look at such a situation. We'll try to kill the file that we just killed only moments ago. So type kill, quote, file name, slash, dat, quote. And sure as next summer, we get a non-existent or NE error, which is a really wonderf wonderful thing, the way we can delete files at random. But what if the file you want to delete is on a disk in another disk drive besides the one you're currently using? There's a simple solution to this question. On all disk commands in BASIC that require a file name, we can also add an optional disk drive number at the end of the file name and extension. For instance, if you, w if you were on disk drive number 0 and you wanted to kill a file on drive number 1, you could do a command like this. Kill, quote, file name, slash, dat, colon, 1. Quote. And if all went well, we should get another non-existent or any error due to the fact that we had no such file on that disk drive. Your disk drive's controller cartridge can support up to four single-sided or two double-sided disk drives with each drive unit numbered from zero to three. So you can see any of those disk drive numbers when specifying a disk drive in a file name will work as long as you actually have the disk drive you're specifying connected to the controller. If you attempt specifying a non-existent disk drives, you will get an error message as a result. For, for instance, if we say kill quote file name slash dat colon three quote and we have no disk drive number three which in my case is true we get another error And, in most cases, where everything you're specifying is connected, you should have no, you should have no problems using this multiple disk drive setup. As long as you place that colon symbol in between the file and extension and the disk drive number, you should never have any trouble specifying drives in a file command that uses any file name. Now before we go, let's go over what we've learned in today's show. First we learned how to use the open command. 
how we can use it to open different files on cassette or on disk. Then we saw how to use the close command, which did the opposite of open. It let us close all those files that we opened up. Then we saw the input number command and how it can be used to get information of either string or numeric types from a file that we've opened. Then we saw the line input number command, which was used similar to the input number command, except we can use it on strings and use commas as part of the data. Then we saw the EOF, or end of file command, and how it can be used with a buffer number to check to see if we reached the end of file before trying to get any more data so that if we did run out of data, we can take steps to close up the file. Then lastly, we saw the kill command and how it can be used to delete files that we don't need anymore, just, don't, just plain don't want anymore, or just making room on a disk. You know, like you've copied stuff from one disk to another and you want to you know, just get rid of the original versions. Plus, we saw how to keep the tape recorder in functioning order with a few different options. That's about all the time we have left for this installment. Remember, if you have a problem with any of the information we've supplied, give us a call. One of our many experienced members of our club will be more than glad to help you with your information. If you missed the show, let us know. We can have a tape of the show you missed ready for you to view at the next meeting. That's about all the time we have for now. So tune in again next time when we continue to learn your color computer.